Your homework is to memorize this and write it 15 times. Welcome to the coolest, fittest half hour of fun on TV. This is Brain Stew with Jennifer Pulley. Hey you, grab your coat, hat, and mittens. This week, Brain Stew discovers the coldest, iciest continent on Earth, Antarctica. You won't believe how cold it can get in Antarctica. Brr. We also learned from the Hampton Roads Admirals and ice hockey team how ice can improve your health and fitness. Plus, we have another cool experiment, and this week's Multimedia Minute will keep your brain chilling. Freeze! Brain Stew is next. Hey, welcome to Brain Stew. My name is Jennifer Pulley. Okay, where's the coldest place you've ever been? In Germany, it was very cold. Maine. Once when I went to Ohio, it was pretty cold. When I was skiing, it was really cold. Hey, me too. When I went skiing in the mountains, it was freezing. Of course, it had to be. You need snow in order to ski. Now, in order for it to snow, the air temperature must be 32 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. I don't know about you, but temperatures below 32 degrees Fahrenheit make me shiver. I get the chill bumps just thinking about it. Okay, now imagine with me, if you will, the coldest place you've ever been. I mean it, close your eyes, no peeking, and think about it. Okay, now that I've got you thinking cold, do you know which one of the seven continents on our planet is the coldest, windiest, iciest place on Earth? Wait, wait, time out, time out. Can you name all seven continents? Yep, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and Antarctica. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Congratulations, you named all seven continents. Now, if you guessed that Antarctica is the coldest, windiest, iciest continent on Earth. You are right. And hey, that's what we're exploring today. Antarctica. Where is Antarctica located? Let me show you on this globe. Antarctica is at the southern tip of the world. See, here it is, right down here. Antarctica is surrounded by three oceans. The Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Atlantic Ocean. And the South Pole is on Antarctica. Got it? Good. Now, Antarctica is not like the other six continents. For one reason, Antarctica is 95% covered with ice. Remember when I said that in order for it to snow, it had to be 32 degrees Fahrenheit or lower? Well, in Antarctica, the snow immediately turns to ice because the temperatures there are so cold. In the wintertime in Antarctica, temperatures can get to minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Another reason Antarctica is different from the other six continents is no one lives there. I mean, would you want to live there? It's freezing. Well, actually, some scientists do live and work there, but only for very short periods of time. It's just too cold. What about plants and animals? Can they survive in Antarctica? Ask no more. All your questions about Antarctica will be answered today by my friend Martin. He works at Nauticus, the National Maritime Center in Norfolk, Virginia. So grab your coat, your mittens, and your hat. Let's go, it's gonna be cold. Ooh, hey Martin, how you doing? I'm doing all right, it's a bit cold, isn't it? Yeah, I'm freezing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, right now we're in the Antarctica exhibit at Nauticus, and Antarctica is the coldest, windiest, and driest continent on the entire planet Earth. Take a look at this picture behind us. You can see that it's just windswept with the snow going from one pile over to another. That's why I'm so cold. Yeah, sorry about that. That's we'll turn okay. up the heat for you. <laughs> Who discovered Antarctica? Well, it's under a little bit of debate. There are a number of different people that have been credited not only with finding Antarctica, but also with exploring it. For example, in 1578, there was a guy from Great Britain by the name of Francis Drake who sailed around the tip of South America. Now, there's another guy from Britain by the name of James Cook who also went exploring south of the Antarctic Circle. He also reported seeing seals and whales, so of yeah. course that meant that a lot of people wanted to go there to do some whaling and sealing. Now there's another person that you need to be aware of by the name of James Ross. In 1841, James Ross went down there and to find the South Magnetic Pole and instead he discovered the Ross Sea, the Ross Islands, and also the Ross Ice Shelf. So he didn't even find the South Pole? 
No, not exactly, but he was able to do quite a bit of exploring and mapping of the area, which is very important for the scientists who are around nowadays. Sure. Is the South Pole on Antarctica? Yes, it is. The South Pole, there are actually two different types of South Pole, and I can illustrate that with my globe over here. Okay, great. There's both a geographic North Pole and South Pole. Here's the geographic North, North Pole. Yep. And down here on the bottom of the Earth, we have the geographic South Pole. But there's also something called a magnetic North Pole That's and a right. magnetic South Pole. Yeah. Are we lost, Martin? Which way to the South Pole? We're right there. OK. At this spot, we're OK. OK. Right now, we're in our mock-up of a dome, which is down at the South Pole. And this is a mock-up of where scientists and researchers would come to do experiments to find out about the Antarctic environment, the effect of pollution, what's happening with the atmosphere. Cool, and that's why we're, we don't have to wear our clothes, exactly. you know, our, our coats nice anymore. Exactly, we're nice and warm, we're right, okay. We're inside the dome. We're 8,759 miles from Norfolk. Who discovered the South Pole? Well, there were many people that went down to explore the South Pole and to try to find out exactly where it was and how to get there. There are two people, two figures that are very important, though, to history. Sometimes they get a little bit too competitive. I have. I guess they were racing, huh? They were racing, okay. and it has kind of a bad ending. This is a picture of a gentleman by the name of Amundsen, who was from Norway. Yeah. And this is a picture of a gentleman by the name of Scott, who was from Great, Great Britain or England. These two gentlemen decided that they were going to try to get to Antarctica and race to get to Antarctica. The year was 1911. Amundsen ended up making it first, and about five weeks later, 35 days later, Robert Scott ended up making it. Not only didn't he make it there first, but he and his party also ended up dying on the return trip. You're kidding. No. Okay. Because of the elements? Exactly. It's just so cold, a harsh condition. And in science, we call it a real bummer. Yeah, that is a total bummer. Okay, now, Antarctica is desolate. I mean, no one lives there, correct? Except for the researchers that are there. Okay, so scientists do live there. Right, right. In fact, they're really the only people that live down there. Why do scientists live in Antarctica? They're there to study, to do research, to do experiments. For example, to learn about the types of animals that will live in a cold, harsh environment. Scientists want to know about the diversity or how many different types of animals will live there, such as this fish, which it's is called an Antarctic cod. Sure does, sure does. The other reason that scientists will go down there is not only to learn about the types of animals that are there, but how do they survive? What keeps them warm in these frigid, subarctic conditions? What kind of animals can survive in Antarctica? Oh, there are quite a few different types. Many of them people are already familiar with, such as this fish. Sure. Penguins. Oh, let's go see penguins. Killer whales. Yeah. Martin, these penguins are just so cute. I They're know. So Everybody just loves these things. They're so nice to look at. This is a wonderful diorama that we have here at the Antarctica exhibit in Nauticus. Yeah. And it's to show a little bit about penguins. And this is pretty wild. If you take a look at penguins or killer whales, like the two stuffed animals that I have in my hand, you'll notice that they're white on the tummy and black on the back. And we made sure to have you wear this homemade shirt, finally made by myself, to show Real the nice. exact same thing. Thank you, thank you. Right, There's a reason video? for it. Who are you kidding? I'm totally serious. Okay. It's called counter shading. How does counter shading help animals? It's a way for an animal to blend into its environment, kind of like camouflage, but a little bit different. If you were to stand at the beach and look down towards the deeper part of the ocean, yep. deeper water, it's darker as you look down. So, if a killer whale is swimming along the bottom, darker background, dark back, it'll blend in, it. exactly. Oh. Or if you look up towards the top of the water, yeah. it's, it's lighter place. up there, yep. a lighter stomach, so it's harder to see. So to prove it, we're gonna go ahead and use you as our example. If you have a white front against a white background, you kind of blend in, it's harder to see you. Now, of course, if you had a white front against a dark background, uh-oh, you stand out a lot easier. So if you're a penguin, it means that this killer whale would be able to find you a lot easier. We don't want that. Not at all. That's called counter shading. And it's something that these animals have to help them adapt to the environment and help them survive so that they don't get chomped on by predators. That's cool. I never knew. That's why they were black and white. Exactly. Now, Jen, there is another reason why these animals will have a dark background and a white belly, uh -huh. just like the penguin you're holding. Why? And that's because of heat and temperature. 
Black is a very good color for absorbing heat, absorbing the warmth from the sun. Yeah, I know if I wear a black shirt like in the summertime, oh, I'm like, Oh, you'll start getting steaming. very hot. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So it's the same reason for these animals. It's a way to help them adapt to this harsh, cold environment that they live in. So that brings in a little bit of heat anyway. Exactly. Their black color. Okay, cool. Can I, can I take this shirt off? Yeah. Okay, so the animals that can survive in Antarctica, we've got the penguin. Which would be a bird. Mm -hmm. The whale. Which would be a mammal. Okay. And here's another one of our mammal friends. We have seals and sea lions that also live in Antarctica. And here's a really cool thing to distinguish between yeah, the two of them. Difference? If you take a look at their ear, seals don't have an external ear. Sea lions will have an external ear. We have an external ear, this little flap that comes around, and the seals don't have that. It would be flat. So this is a seal? Exactly, exactly. A good old seal friend over here. Sammy the seal? Sammy the seal. Okay, he's kind of cute. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stump him, guys. I'm gonna stump him. Martin. Yes. If Antarctica is surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. we all know that oceans are made of salt water. How does the water in Antarctica freeze? That's a very good question, very good point. Normally, you don't think about ocean water freezing. Here in Virginia, here in Norfolk, we don't see the water freezing very often. Boils down, no pun intended, mm -hmm. the one main thing. It's just so cold down there. It's I mean, freezing down there. This is huge. This is an iceberg. It's made out of salt, salt water. Salt water and also fresh water. Here's the interesting thing about Antarctica. Antarctica has the largest supply of fresh water in the world. About 70% of the Earth's fresh water is locked up as ice, frozen water, frozen H2O. Now, oh, cool. the interesting thing is that the land or the air up above the water is very, very cold. Water itself is actually warm, at least warm compared to the air. And I can show you this with an experiment. All right. So Jen, I'm going to go ahead and very carefully light this candle. That's why I have you here, to make sure that I'm using the matches properly. Okay. And this is gonna show us now that air is warmer than water. Exactly. Oh, no, no, water is warmer than air. <laughs> right, right, water is warmer than air, okay. and also the water is a lot better at absorbing heat or holding heat, which is why it is warmer. Okay. So the first part of the experiment is going to be using my favorite toy in the whole wide world, which is a balloon. The balloon is filled with air. We're going to have you oh, no. hold the balloon over the candle. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? I have a feeling it's going to pop. It's going to pop. And make a really loud noise. So I'm going to get to cover my ears because you're going to be holding the balloon. Okay, here we go, kids. Not fair at all. All right. So it did exactly what we expected it to do. Sure. Now for Because the there next, was air in it. There was air in it, and air is not very good at absorbing or holding heat. Okay. So our balloon ended up popping. We're going to do something a little bit different now. We'll go ahead and relight the candle. Nice job. Thank you very much. This time we're going to use <laughs> a water balloon. Can I beam that at the door? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's do it. Now, because you're going to be holding this water balloon over the candle, do I need a, a we, raincoat we assume something? that it's going to pop. So in case it does, Jen, I'm going to move back a little bit. Okay, go ahead. He's so nice. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I hope I need a wardrobe, change of clothes. Okay, just hold it right over here. Mm -hmm. And let's see if it pops. Go ahead. Hold it a little lower. Lower? So go ahead and actually touch that flame. No! And it should pop, and it should <gasps> splash all over the place. Keep going. Oh. Nothing. Nothing at all. Unlike the air, water is very good at absorbing or holding heat. And you can see it's not popped on the bottom at all. So just like in the real world, the ocean in Antarctica is warmer than the air that's around it. Pretty cool, huh? Cool, Martin, thanks. Sure, not a problem. Oh, wow. And you didn't get soaked at all. I'm glad, because I would have had to have a word with you if that would have happened. <laughs> Go like this. Good. Almost 80% of what we just snarfed into our lungs is the element nitrogen. Nitrogen is a gas, but when nitrogen is in a liquid state, it's colder than Antarctica. It can be 320 degrees below zero. Fahrenheit? You're Fahrenheit. kidding me. Now, since this stuff is so cold, it's kind of dangerous. Okay. We need to make sure that we're safe, so go ahead and put your safety goggles on. Oh, I've worn these before. And, and to go ahead and protect our hands for this experiment, we're going to go ahead and put on our safety gloves. And the last thing that we're going to do is get some of our liquid mm. nitrogen. This is a special <laughs> container that's been designed to go ahead and hold something that's very, very cold. I'll go ahead and pour some of it Whoa. into this container. And the first thing you notice is what? It's steaming. It's, it's boiling. Steaming. Yeah, you can see steam and smoke coming all over the place. Go ahead and breathe down into it. Well, that's freezing. Yeah. What's happening is the liquid nitrogen is so cold that it's freezing the water vapor that's in the air around us and causing it to condense. Cool. 
Ooh. Here's the next experiment. I'll go ahead and pour some of it into this clear glass beaker. Look at what that. do you notice now? It's boiling water. Exactly. This stuff is boiling at room temperature. The room temperature is what? 65, 70 degrees yeah. around us? That's warmer than minus 320 degrees. So the heat from this room goes into the liquid nitrogen and causes it to boil. It's amazing how cold this yeah. is. Now, you're telling me if we let it sit long enough, it'll evaporate? It would eventually just evaporate or boil away. Just like if you're at home and you take water, put it into a pot, put it on the stove, turn the stove on high, the water will boil and eventually boil away. That's what's happening. Instead of water in a liquid state, we have nitrogen in a liquid state. And listen to the sound of it. Yeah, check it out. So temperatures don't ever get this cold on our on No, Antarctica. they don't. They okay. certainly don't. Hey, is your brain frozen? Well, don't thaw it out just yet, because up next we learn from the Hampton Roads Admirals how ice can improve your health and fitness. Plus, we visit some wacky librarians who show us some books, videos, and websites to keep you chilling on this week's Multimedia Minute. Freeze. Don't touch that remote. Guys, I'm here with Kale Short and Rod Taylor of the Hampton Roads Admirals. And guys, you know we've been talking about Antarctica, okay? And there's like tons of ice in Antarctica, but we're not in Antarctica. But there's ice, and I'm cold. Where are we? And what do you guys do on the ice? Oh, we're in Norfolk Scope, and uh, we play ice hockey. You know, that's the next best thing right here to be in Antarctica. So this is great. Other than that, we don't have the penguin. How does ice hockey improve your health and fitness? Well, it's uh, great for your uh, cardiovascular. Uh, you always work in, uh, you loop, uh... Gotcha! <laughs> Playing hockey, you gotta stay in shape. Uh, a lot of people think it's just a winter sport, but for us, you gotta train all summer and, uh, and come to training camp in good shape. Just strong legs, good cardiovascular, uh, energy and that. Just do your best while you're on the ice. What do you need to play ice hockey? First of all, you need skates, but you have boots on. Okay, so you work. have to have skates. Uh, you need uh, gloves. Like what these? you have. Okay. And we need a stick. What you have. Okay. You need uh, shin pads. Which yeah. Are you, these right here. Yeah, you got a lot of padding. Yep, on that there. way in case the puck hits it, you ain't gonna get hurt. You got these big goofy pants. It's all they're all padded. All padded, padded to make sure that you uh, protect yourself. Is this padded too? Good? Uh actually there is a pad there, but <laughs> okay. there's, like, there's a lot of open areas there. So. Uh, then you got the shoulder pads right here, which if we can see them. There's my chest protector, then I got pads here. Yeah. And these things here are my elbow pads. Okay, so say I'm a kid and I get all that equipment that we just talked about. How do I get started in ice hockey? Well, what you do is usually do is you go to your uh, local uh, skating rink, and they usually have leagues that are set up. Like, uh, for instance, here they have the Ice Land and Ice Palace. Yep. And they have uh, uh, the Junior Admirals, it's called. All right? Just, just like little us. Animals. Just, just little animals. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> Not like you guys. Yeah, you got to start with. Full face protection, yep. good padding is, is really key uh, so you, you don't get injured and, and things like that. Injuries are, are part of hockey and uh, hopefully things like that don't happen, but uh, they do, so. And I take it you guys both went to school. Oh, yeah. Right, because yeah. I'm a school teacher, so you guys oh, yeah. got your studies done, I hope. Go to college and play profession, or college and uh, hockey in college, I should say. And uh, I think that was a great time there, and uh, you got to learn all your skills, speaking skills, so you can speak way better than what I have been doing today. So, uh, to better yourself. <laughs> and always read. Okay, guys, I know I'm missing skates, and I know I'm missing the helmet, but, and I'm a girl. Can you show me how to shoot a puck? Because didn't the women win the Olympic gold? The yes, women, they did. The women did win the gold. They and, they, and, and Rod's from the U.S. I'm from Canada. Rod's got bragging rights over me. That's so. right. All right. Well, sh show me how. Show me how to shoot sure this puck thing. here. All right. So you shoot right-handed. So yep. you got your top hand. Yep. Right. And then you got your bottom hand. So you're gonna slide the bottom hand down. Right there. That's perfect. Okay. Always concentrate and watch the puck. First, you look at your target. Yep. Where you want to shoot it. Right? Okay, what if I whip it? No, you won't whip <laughs> it because you're going to be watching the puck and you're going to try to hit it as hard as you can. Right in there. Oh, yeah. Bend those knees.
guys, I want to thank you so much. That wasn't that bad. I didn't even know. Okay, job. Great job. Great job. Great it was job. awesome. Thanks for giving us the cold, hard facts on iPad. Wow. Such a cloud. So what are you doing still sitting on the couch? Get up off the couch, get a pair of skates, a stick, some gloves, get out on the ice and start skating. Or I'll throw you in the belly box. box. How does a, hold on one second. How does color affect the penguin's body temperature? Let's find out. Here's what you'll need. Two cans, a ruler, scissors, tape, a lamp, and a white and black piece of construction paper, and two thermometers. No, real thermometers. Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah, make sure that the ribs aren't jagged. You don't want to cut your hands. Here's the procedure. Cut the white and black piece of construction paper so that they fit around the cans. We'll see, I've already done it because my brother is gonna pick me up any minute. I don't want to be late. Next, take the black sheet of paper and place it around the can. Now take the white sheet of paper and tape it around the other can. You with me so far? Place one thermometer in each can. Read and record the temperature on each thermometer. Next, place the cans 12 inches away from the lamp. Turn on the light, read and record the temperatures on both thermometers after 10 minutes. Check out these results. As you can see, the temperature is much higher in the can covered with black paper. The black paper absorbs more light waves than the white paper. The white paper is cooler because it reflects more of the light waves than the black paper. The absorption of the light waves increases the temperature of a material. Just like in Antarctica, the white parts of a penguin absorb less light energy while the black parts absorb more light energy. Penguins are white on their bellies and black on their backs. Their black color absorbs more sunlight and helps keep penguins warm in the cold Arctic air. Okay, I've had enough wind and ice and snow for one day. As for next week's show, hmm, I suggest we go someplace warm in Florida, maybe the Caribbean. Stop dreaming? Okay, I will. Who knows where Brain Stew will end up next week? Until then, keep that big brain of yours stewing, because you never know what you'll learn. Well, that wasn't that bad, guys. I appreciate how you. <laughs> well, you guys, that wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> nice come flaming on me. Three, two, I got it's coming out of my both hands. Oh yeah. Um, make sure that the. Um, <laughs> that's like the, uh, I totally forgot. Like when you said three, two, and I'm like, uh oh, I forgot what to say. I was like, ah. I mean, really, like close your eyes and imagine it. Oh, the penguin just moved. One means go, Mary Lovell. I can't one. I was like, you guys are about to say one.